welcome to the Reverie Nature Podcast. Get ready to explore a series of episodes on the nature experience, from engaging bushcraft, reading animal tracks and sign, exploring the world of nature soundscapes, and much more. But before we dig in, a big thank you to our listeners. Please take this moment to subscribe and offer your support to the podcast. I'm Chad Clifford, your host and guide, and today I'm introducing a new series on the Reverie Nature podcast. It is called Legends of Environmental Stewardship. So as we embark on this captivating journey through time, we'll breathe life into the stories of visionary figures who shaped the course of environmental conservation. People like John Muir, David Thoreau, and Grayell, and more to follow. Let their stories inspire and ignite your passion for nature and environmental stewardship. This episode is entitled Champion of the Wilderness, A Journey with Grey Owl. In the realm of conservation, Grey Owl stands out as a figure of both complexity and mystery. His life journey traversed continents and cultures, leaving an indelible mark on the history of conservation. Born Archie Bellany in Hastings, England in 1888, Grey Owl would later adopt an indigenous identity, dedicating himself to the protection of wilderness and wildlife in Canada. Through his compelling writings, captivating lectures, and magnetic persona, Grey Owl captured the hearts and minds of his audiences worldwide, shining a light on the challenges that faced North America's forest and wildlife. Now picture yourself by a tranquil lake near Tomogamy, with a gentle breeze blowing off the lake as storyteller Howard Clifford reveals Grey Owl's profound connection to nature and his enduring legacy as a champion of the wilderness. My name is Archie Bellini, better known by most as Grayall. I was born in 1888 in Hastings, England. My father uh, had a drinking, serious drinking problem, and my mother was only 14 years of age. And so the total family thought they just were not capable of taking care of me. And so the decision was made for me to be raised by two maiden aunts. Now, you have to remember, back in those days, it was a real problem, a stigma. If you had a father who was alive but wasn't there to look after you, and there was only one other child in my school that had was in that situation, and none that had neither a father or a mother uh, who were both alive that were not uh, in the home. And my aunt, uh, both of them, but my one that did the uh, most in raising me, she, she did her best, she did care, but I think she always worried that I might have the kind of family background of my father and, and, and mother. And so she was very strict. And when I tried to find out information about my parents, I could tell she just didn't want to talk about them. And it was almost as if she felt that they were inferior and, and that made me feel, well, I ha inherit their genes. Uh, maybe I am too. But during my childhood, I, I tried to do escape by, oh, I'd read books about Indians in the, the United States and Canada. And I thought, oh, wouldn't I love to be born an Indian? Just think, get up when you want to, do whatever you do, perfect freedom in a land where rivers would go for hundreds and maybe even thousands of miles, forests so vast uh, they could swallow up my little town of Hastings. And so all my fantasy was being Indian. Uh, where others would play cowboys and Indians, I was always the Indian. And when Buffalo Bill actually came with his Indians, to uh, cowboys to our town. 
uh, all, everybody else, of course, wanted to see the cowboys, but me, I wanted to see the Indians. And so I was a bit of a rebel. And when I was 17 years of age, I'd finally convinced my maiden aunt to let me go to Canada. And so I was only 17, it was 1906. And I, I got a job in Toronto, in Eaton. But you know, there was no Indians there. So I saved up as much as I could until I had enough to take a train to go where people said the Indians were closest, and that was Tamagami. But they warned me, they said, you're white. They're not going to have, want to have anything to do with you. And as I got closer to Tamagami, I, I began to have this little fear that maybe I had fantasized too much about them. Maybe they wouldn't want to have anything to do with me. But oh, they took me under their wing. I think the difference is that they know your heart. And when they are mainly uh, related to white people who thought they were inferior, they're not going to be giving themselves to them or sharing their inner thoughts. But with me, they knew how much I respected everything that they stood for and that I wanted to be like them. Well, I was only 22 when uh, I married a full-blooded Indian woman, Angel. Okay. And so Angel and I uh, got married, and she knew my heart, that I really wanted to be just like them, identify with them. And she taught me so much um, how to speak Indian, and, but I'd go hunting with the other Indians, and sometimes we'd go for some quite a few weeks at a time. And it got that I was going longer and longer and longer apart. And it's just that our, it was my fault, nothing that she ever did, but a marriage just wasn't working out. And I found myself going uh, further and further away. And oh, I recall this one time. I, I went to this place where I was going to set up camp, build a cabin while the cabin was already built for uh, the winter and to spend the winter there. But it was one of those beautiful late fall days. And so I thought I would just go and scout around. Uh, there was a bit of snow on the ground, but it was so warm that I didn't take any warm clothes or anything because I was only going to go for a couple of hours just to see where it might be best to put my traps and so forth. But as it was getting dark, all of a sudden we were hit. Well, I was hit by a blizzard. I couldn't even see six inches in front of my eyes. And so I kept going and going and I realized, oh, I'm lost. But then, suddenly in front of me, I saw snowshoe tracks. I thought, oh, there must be another trapper out here that I hadn't heard about. Certainly, I, I'll follow these tracks, get to his cabin, and they'll certainly make me welcome. And I went and I went, and, and then I noticed there were more shoe, snowshoe tracks. And then went and went, and it was even more. And I thought, it must be an Indian group up here. And then a sudden thought hit me, and I looked at my snowshoes, and they were the same. I'd been walking all this time in circles, and I had no idea where I was. But on this one little ledge, they broke for just for a minute where I could see, and I saw my cabin. And so I made my way back there. I would have perished for sure because I hadn't any warm clothes. I didn't really have the skills to make it uh, overnight. 
And so you wouldn't even be hearing about this story if it hadn't have been that, it, that the snow storm just broke for that minute where I could then uh, see my way back to the cabin. Well, I eventually made my way to Bisco. Oh, it was a wonderful country up there. And I got jobs uh, with, with the ministry and, and spending my time trapping and making friends with, with Indians there. And then I went back to Tomogamy. I was now 25 or 26 years of age. And as I was canoeing into this resort area, I noticed this Indian lady watching me. And so I put on my sort of stride to be a real Indian. Because by this time I had begun telling people that I was half Indian and half white, that I had a, a, a Scottish father and my, my mother had been an Apache. Well, it turned out that her name was, was um, Bernard. Um, Gertrude was her first name. And I thought, Gertrude, what kind of a name is that for an Indian? Your name is Anna Hero. And from that day on, that's what people called her and what she was known for for the rest of her life. Well, she was full-blooded India from an Ottawa town of Mattawa. And uh, she did go back, and I went there to visit. And it just turned out that she, she was a bit of a rebel herself, and, uh, and she had thought of me as uh, uh, Jesse James. So I talked her into going with me for the winter on a trapping trip. Well, she, even though she was full-blooded Indian, she was a town Indian. She had never really spent any time out in the woods, except maybe the odd overnight thing. But she put on her pack sack and was following me. And we'd gone for a few hours, and she said, Archie, how much further do we have to go? And I said, oh, not far, 40 miles. She said, 40 miles. But she kept on going and going. And then we got to this place where I had had my friends build a cabin. But she didn't see the cabin. What I had was a root house where you could go down into this cave. And, and that's where I said, this is where we're going to be spending our winter. And she went down in there, and it was built out, had a little stove and stuff, but she just couldn't believe that this is what she was going to be spending the winter in. But in the morning, came out, and there was the cabin. And we called it Pony Cabin, because her nickname was also Pony. Well, at first I left her behind as I went trapping, uh, but she kept saying she wanted to come. She wanted to come with me. So this one day she was with me, but we were coming to this small lake, mainly a big pond, but it's dangerous because it's ice, but you could fall through. And so I knew already I had enough experience. I could, with my stick, just tap the ice and just know how strong it was. And so I said to her, you stay back at least uh, 30 feet from me, because if the ice is going to break through, you don't want to be near it. Well, I was tapping away, going very cautiously. And all of a sudden, I hear this bang, crash. I thought, oh no. I turned around and sure enough she had tried to catch up and she went through the ice and disappeared. And I'm trying to get back there 
but it kind of go slow because the ice was that rotten. And uh, there she popped up and I got down on my stomach getting close and with my with my stick I gave it to her to pull on the climb out and then I said you run back as quick as you can now to the cabin and I'll I'll get some firewood so we can get a fire going but you, you've got to run fast because your clothes are going to freeze and you only be able to move well she managed to get back I managed to get a fire going we got her under all the blankets and she survived but that was another instance of how people that really don't know what they're doing can get in serious trouble in the Canadian wilderness. We had of course numerous adventures and things that uh, brought me more and more into good relationships with the native community but um, because of shortage of time now uh, I'll just mention that we had to go further and further to do trapping because the beavers were just disappearing. Uh, they were just being trapped by a lot of newcomers that were coming in and they um, were not good trappers and they would actually blow up uh, the lodges with dynamite and they didn't care like the Indians did. They would never t uh, hunt when their kits were there. Uh, because then you're not going to have any uh, future beaver colonies. And so I, we were noticing this. And then one day uh, a white person who was a, a new trapper as well, but he was a friend and a good hearted person. And he came to me and he said, Archie, I, I need help. Uh, I've trapped this beaver, but it somehow didn't work. And it's standing now within, in, in, trapped. On, on top of the lodge and uh, uh, would you come and shoot it for me? So I certainly didn't want a, any suffering like that to take place so I went and there was this beaver with its one arm with paw, paw caught in a beaver trap and so I raised my rifle and but just as I took another look I saw in her eyes a deeper hurt more than the physical pain it seemed like almost what you call a, a soul pain. And then I looked more carefully and in her other paw was a baby kit and she was nursing it. And it was as if her fear and anguish was that this was the last meal she knew she'd be able to give to her kit. And then what would happen to that kit? It would either starve to death or be torn apart by wolves or other predators. And so I dropped my white rifle and I knew her arm would be pain free now because it would be without circulation. I took my hatchet and I cut the arm off or the paw off and there she was free. And she looked at me as if to say, I know you are the enemy of our people. You kill us for no reason, but somehow you found it in your heart to have mercy on me and my kit. And then with the kit in her arm, she dove into the pond. Well, that shook me. And uh, then later that fall, I'd actually, well actually now it was into spring, and uh, it was too late really, I knew it was too late. Uh, but, oh well, I'm going to pick up my traps and, and Anna here and I was in the canoe and as we were getting close to the, uh, where the last trap was, we heard uh, like a baby crying in the wilderness and Anna here said, what would anybody be away out here with a baby? And I said, no, that's a baby beaver. They're crying just like a human cries. And she said, oh, then we've got to get it. And I said, yes, we do, because I wanted to put it out of its mercy. We were, we were too late in the season that we shouldn't have been trapping then. And there we heard the cry of the beaver. And, mm -hmm. and the other one, there's two of them. So I 
managed to grab one and gave it back to her and then I paddled and got the other one. And I noticed she was putting them down her blouse. And I said, what are you doing? She said, why, well, I'm taking them home because to our cabin because I'm going to raise them. And I said, what kind of an Indian are you? You can't possibly raise these. Yes, I can until they're old enough to go on their own. Well, I knew she was strong-minded and therefore uh, I thought, well, it's not going to work out, but so be it. Well, all that summer they were uh, growing and I learned something about them that was different than anything I knew about them before. I knew everything that beavers did. I knew where they built, why they built, what kind of food they ate, everything about them. Except I didn't realize this, that each one of them had a distinct personality, just as each human being has a distinct personality. And both of these little beavers had different personalities too, but they had taken us as if we were their parents, we were part of their family. And when I'd go off hunting, uh, and be gone a few days, they would come back, and uh, I would come back rather, and there they were, and they would be so angry at me thinking I had deserted them. And they would stomp their feet, and one would even come up and point its fing finger right on my chest. But soon it was this hugging and really happy to see me. Then it came time to move camp, and so we had all our stuff put into the canoe and went to get the beavers and one of them was missing. So I got in the canoe going around and around trying to find them, spent hours looking and had given up and had just gotten almost back to the cabin when I heard the, it, its call. And there it was stuck in the muck uh, back in this eddy and it was almost like in quicksand. And I went there and, and uh, I couldn't reach it because it was in the muck, so I stepped out of the canoe and grabbed him, but then I was sinking deeper and deeper. But by then, Anna Hero had heard the rackets and it had come, and so I handed it, the, the beaver to her and, and then managed to get out, cleaned myself off of all this muck, and I was so angry because now we couldn't leave, it was too late in the evening. and. Uh, I knew if I said something, I would just say many things that I should not to be saying, because I was so angry. And uh, I cleaned myself off, laid down exhausted on the bed, and I noticed the little beaver was cleaning himself off too. And then just as it about to doze off, the beaver jumped up on the bed, onto my chest, looked me straight in the eye, as if to say, I knew, I know that you're angry at, with me, but you saved my life. And it began to nuzzle under my chin, and within 30 seconds was snoring away. And I knew at that point that I loved them. And the next day, I gathered my traps again and threw them on the table and said, down a hero. I am no longer a trapper. And she had tears in her eyes. She said, oh, how long I wanted you to say this. And I said, but what, what can I do? I, I can't go back and live in a city. And she said, no, but you're, write, you're writing books. You had articles that have been written and you speak really, really well. Uh, why don't we use you to do that, to start an organization to save the beaver. You know they're disappearing. Look what would happen to the Indians and everybody else if, we, if Canada lost its beaver population. Well, somehow word got out and I was invited to speak to this group and they said they would take up a donation uh, for me. And I, this is my first public speech, and I felt like I said, I felt like I had just sw was uh, 
like a rattlesnake that had swallowed a icicle. I just, but I can't say anything. What am I going to say? And then I looked in the corner, and there was Anna Hero holding one a McGinty, which was one of the uh, beavers. And I knew I was speaking for something much bigger than myself. And so I spoke, I think probably for an hour. And afterwards, she said, the woman that organized it said, here is the donation we've taken up. $1,000! That would be more than I would make in two or three years. Well, then it happened. That word got out to the uh, federal government about the looking after these beavers. And, and so they offered me a job as the first naturalist in Prince Albert National Park. And they had a little lake that was about 20 miles off the main lake. Just far enough that people that really wanted to talk with me uh, would be able to hike that distance. But the people that were just curiosity seekers, it would be too far for them. And so on this little lake, they built a cabin for us and, and uh, our two little beavers began to build their lodge and they built it right against the house and actually came into our house and, and was right underneath us. Well, then we got word because I was, had written this book and this person that had become the publisher uh, was actually from England and they wanted to promote the book and to have me come there for a couple of months to promote the book and they set up hundreds of different uh, speaking engagements and sometimes I'd do two in a day once in a while, even three engagements. And it was so popular that they kept needing more and more venues. In fact, they say I spoke to over 250,000 people during that time. And during that time also, the uh, king uh, and the king's mother, the mother had read my book and was thrilled that I was in England and asked the king to invite me to speak at the Buckingham Palace. Well, just think, they thought I was Indian, or at least half Indian, and yet I hadn't been, I'd been raised not that far away at Hastings. But I went and they said, well, the people around that was organizing it said, okay, here's how it works. Uh, you will be here when the king comes in. You'll come in last, and then and he'll stand. And then when he's seated, you'll speak, and you only speak for twenty minutes. And I said, "No." They said, "What do you mean, no?" I said, "No. I'm representing the Indians of Ontario." And I'm representing the beaver people. I come in last. And uh, my publisher was there. Say, you know, he was really upset. And don't, don't disturb things like this. I said, no. It's either that or I don't do it. And so the people that worked for the king went over and whispered something in his ear. And he smiled and nodded. And so... I came in last. The king and family was seated. The, she, the uh, princess was only a teenager then, a young teenager. Uh, and she, of course, now is your queen. But I thought, well, they've gone this far for me. I will honor the 20 minute limit on my speaking. So I spoke for 20 minutes and then about to stop when the Princess Elizabeth yelled out, Oh, Mr. Grayall, won't you speak some more? Some more? And I looked at the king. He smiled and nodded. So I ended up speaking for an hour. 
Well, then I came back and then I went again for a second visit to England. By that time I was more famous than the Prime Minister of Canada. But by this time, even though I wasn't that old, I was uh, it's 49, I guess my schedule had been so hard on me that I just felt completely exhausted. And on the way back to Canada, I had one more speaking engagement. It was the end of March in uh, 38, 1938. And when I arrived there at Massey Hall, uh, they looked at me and they said, Oh, he, you're too sick. Well, you're not able to go on. And I said, No, I'll go on. But I just laid back in the back room, felt so exhausted. But then when the music came on, there was something like the wilderness force welled up in me and I went striding forward and spoke and there were 3,000 people there. And at the end of it, they say it was the first time a standing, a standing only ovation. Well, then I knew I was sick. So I headed back to the little cabin in Prince Albert Park, National Park. Um, but I had to call during the night on, my, on the uh, telegraph phone saying, I'm really sick. So they came and got me and took me to the hospital. And in a couple of days I had passed away. Well, it just so happened that one person who was a member of the press had found out that I really wasn't an Indian, but they hadn't released that story because they knew I was doing so much for the beavers and also for the Indians. And so they weren't going to give away my cover. But when I was now passed away, they said, now it's time to release it. And there was an uproar that you wouldn't believe because they thought I had been a con artist, that I had fooled and deceived all these people. But as my wife Anna Hero said, why, if he was a con artist, why didn't we make any money? All the money that we did make, we gave it to the foundation. Why would he pick to be an Indian when everybody despised him? And why especially would he pick to be a, a half Indian, which neither party really had much to do with? Because, you see, I'd gotten to the point that I identified so much with the Indian culture. I didn't want to be connected with England anymore. And so I'd made up my story of being half Indian. But, you know, the difference between myth and fact is maybe a myth isn't always true in the details, but tells a much deeper truth of what I really was in spirit. And uh, of course, during that time, uh, there were many, many people who uh, were upset with me. But today, the historians say I was the first great Canadian naturalist. And I can, I can say this, I'd leave two thoughts with you. To me, what makes a country great and what makes a person great is how kind you are to animals, the kin that you share this planet with. And last of all, I leave this with you. Remember this. You are part of nature. You belong to nature. Nature does not belong to you. And if I, with all my fables and foils and, and, and uh, problems, could do this much to help save our forests, our beavers, then you who have not had this kind of background, what excuse do you have not to be able to do your share. My name is Grayall. I thank you for being able to share my story with you.
Thank you for joining us on the Reverie Nature Podcast. Remember to subscribe for more captivating episodes exploring the wonders of the natural world. Until next time, may you saunter forth embracing nature's song and may the whispers of the wilderness linger in your heart. Thank you.